Hi, I'm Seamless, and this is the making of Ammunition Part 3. This is the mixing and mastering one, which will be a lot shorter than the sound design one. And it's not just because the sound design one was full of all of the awesome things, and it's hard just to get through it all, but mostly because this was one of the easiest tracks to mix on the entire album. Uh, although it's a little bit similar for um, Forever. Forever was also pretty easy to mix. And the reasons for that actually have to do with arrangement concerns. I talked about, I talk about this a lot whenever I'm talking to a student about mixing and mastering. Man, that, that idle CPU of there, but um, <clears throat> talking about how there's, there's the, idea, the idea of mixing is that you want to put stuff together and make it sound good when it's together. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do to make things work together, but there's also such, a, such concepts as not having certain things together, limiting how many things are competing at one time. And that's, that's as much a mixing decision as, as, as is an arrangement decision. <laughs> It is as much a mixing decision as it is an arrangement de arrangement decision. Jesus, uh, stuff like um, when people talk about like how I don't think I do anything that's in this particular track, but like like fills, you know, like how to make a fill pop against everything else and make the toms hit really hard, that kind of thing. It's a lot easier when it's the only thing happening, and cutting at certain things in in uh, you know out of other stuff to make room for other things as like as part of the song itself makes it a lot easier. It also helps when it comes to making stuff loud because the loudest songs that have ever been were all ones that were doing the least amount of stuff because the less there is to mix, the harder, the easier it is to mix. Anyway, um, beyond that, there's also certain things like the instruments, the, the uh, various like drums and stuff that I'm using, there's, there's actually no drum mixing in specific because usually when I, do, when I talk about the mixing part of, the, of mixing and mastering, I also talk about how the drums work. And here, here's the mixing, the drums bus, and there's nothing. There's a high pass filter because I high passed it in, in the beginning of the, in, in the drop. But there's no compressor. There's no compressor. They're just being bussed together and then they go as a bus into the master. So everything's being compressed together there. Now, of course, talking about compression, we have to start to consider other things as well. I mean, really, the nitty gritty of this whole track is that there's a big ass, there's, there's big ass side chain. I high passed everything at a certain level, and then I have a separate sub that's being side chain too. And then I just have the drums as they are, and then they get mixed and they get compressed. Like that's that's all this song is. There's not like I, I'm not I don't really like I don't, I don't really like to, but I also don't talk about individual things like like leveling and whatever because you can't really generalize that kind of stuff. It's going to be different for every single song. And the only real guide anyone's ever going to have about how well a mix is working is whether or not it sounds good. And it's sort of like how, it's sort of what solutions you want to have to make things work if they don't work is where mixing skill comes into play, where you can have specific solutions. This is usually why I don't talk about, like, I don't have, like, mixing and mastering tutorials because of that reason, because it's really, I can't just make a one-size-fits-all that works for everybody. Not even the same genre, because intertrack differences, if you just look, go look at your favorite artists in a particular genre, you might notice there's a huge variance in not just, like, you know, skill and, and, and style, rather, but, like, just full-on how they sound, how loud they are, what hits harder, and how, what things are leveled out, or just different from person to person. And it's not really a question of good or bad, it's just different. It's hard to teach that. So... Like the true technical marvels of these tracks are usually what happens with the side chaining. So like if I just disable the side chaining, for example, let's listen to the drop with the side chaining. And then listen to it without side chaining. This might seem like a really basic thing to draw attention to, to the idea of the side chaining, but like this right here, how this sounds is how a lot of like really new producers stuff sounds, and they and they're wondering like why the drums aren't as punchy, and they wonder why stuff's all like over top and that kind of thing, and they try to do simple stuff like just regular EQing and whatever, but the biggest solution to make things work in a mix like this is just to cut giant holes in the mix to fit everything else, which is what the side chaining does. I'm of course calling it side chaining, but it's really ducking. Uh, so like a, a good sort of, if you look at the, this limiter here, I'm using it as, as, like a, as like a peak sort of analyzer. That's how hard this, the, the, the ducking is hitting everything. It's super duper all the way down to the bottom. And what that does is this means that like for right there, right, right that right that one second, the loudest part of the percussion has no competition. It isn't actually doing anything against anything else. And so this means that for that second, it could be as loud as it could possibly be. 
which is zero db because we're limiting everything to zero db on the master. Um, there are some there are some important considerations, like for example the uh, chords. These guys, they do have a bass component, which is this guy. This is something that I figured out a long ass time ago when it comes to sort of these kinds of chords and the kind of bass that goes with it. The bass actually has its own sort of own part eventually, but this is the kind of bass that's specifically designed to interact with these chords. And it's really not that difficult. Like the chords you can see, they're high pass. They don't really go that far anyway, but they, they exist to create, you know, higher frequency sort of pads, you know, pads. It's, I call them chords, but they're pads. And then um, the bass, kind of fills up the lower end, although the bass itself is also being high pass because it's being high pass at the very end over here. But like the value of that kind of this kind of sound with like the high a bass with a higher frequency material interacting with the higher frequency high, higher frequency material of like the, the lead chord stabs is that those frequencies there it's it's in key, right? So they're it's the bass the root note of the chord lower than the chord and they interact and it really just kind of fills everything out. It's as super basic as that. Like you could, you could just as easily, honestly, do this kind of thing with just a naked saw wave. Just have a saw wave that is the high chord and just play a lower note, and it'll sound pretty awesome. A lot of older electro was based on just doing that, and in fact, a lot of newer electro is still based on doing that. And this is just kind of a variation on that concept. More about how that worked out was in the sound design video. So if you haven't seen the sound design video, go watch that. That's part two of the making of ammunition. And uh, not really anything else kind of interacted with that, and that's kind of the point is that. Every individual element is very kind, is very individual, and the things that kind of interact with it are so high frequency and so so like cut up in such a way in, on the EQ spectrum that they don't interact and they don't create um, conflict that has to be resolved through compression or EQing, 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 EQing which is actually a special its own form of compression. Uh, I mentioned this and some other things, but I just kind of want to bring up the point that you really have to separate in your head the idea of a compressor and the idea of compression. Compressors accomplish compression, but you, compre you, you compress things all the time, even if you don't use compressors. Because when you EQ something to make room for something else and you end up reducing your headroom, you reduce the dynamic range of your song. Because if, you if you didn't make that cut, the peak would have been higher, and then when they're not conflicting, they would have been where they were. So that meant that the, the lower peak is still the same as it was before, the higher peak is higher, which increases your range of dynamics. And if you make that room to make that fit, and you do, or you do even even more special side chaining where your side chaining uh, EQ parameter to go down whenever the other sound comes in, you're increasing your headroom so you can turn it up louder, which is a product of what you do when you compress stuff because you reduce dynamic range. This is also just basic leveling when you, when you dislevel stuff and that kind of thing. A compressor is a more heavy-handed approach that autom is, is just automation, auto volume automation to bring peaks down when the peaks happen. And... All at the time in the history of have ever, ever having produced anything since compressors were a thing, pro professorial engineers will always say to not use compressors, which has been construed into now to being saying that people aren't supposed to use compression, when that's really not what they were saying. They were saying that you shouldn't use compressors, you know, in the, to very heavy-handedly heavy solve problems that you could have absolutely solved with mixing. This is a bit different with the more modern styles of production because honestly, a lot about how these things, these songs sound, like the style, the feeling, the weight of it all, all those buzzwords, is accomplished through heavy-handed compression. This is why it sounds that way. So you can't, like, you can understand the reasoning behind such sort of wizardly advice, but it's also you have to take in consideration the your modern times, the modern times, because a lot of the uh, a lot of the rules of thumb that were created over time were created for genres in mind that don't exist anymore. I mean, that's not true at all. They, every, every kind of every kind of genre that's ever existed still exists, but it's not the kind of thing that we're doing now. And uh, that's the end of that. Which also, like, given how heavy-handed everything is, it does kind of make things a lot easier because I just don't have to care about it as much. Um, I can just push things as hard as I want and level stuff as I will, and then uh, it's just, it works out. Um, also, something else that I do a lot, like what I say, is that I do the mixing and mastering while I make the track. Which is brings it, it makes it a bit complicated because the, I don't really separate the ideas of what a mix is and what a master is, and really in the beginning of the idea of a mix and masters that was the case back then as well. The, all that mastering, all all the mastering was was just average normalization of a track on an album, on, on, on an LP. You mastered everything together. So that when they we played it continuously from beginning to end, everything was kind of the same level, and you didn't, you didn't have to turn the volume up or down between tracks. And you know that was all that mastering ever was in the beginning. And, and then the mix was just regular, just mixed it to sound good, right? 
that's still kind of what we're doing. And but even when we use master compression on the master channel, it's and we think of it, think of it as being mastering. It's really still just mixing. Um, and to that to that end, I've always just done both at once. It's like you know the words evolve and times change, and what mastering is is obviously a bit different than what mastering was. But the heart of it and the reason we did it and the purpose of it all is still kind of the same. But uh, now instead of it being average normalization across an, an independent album, it's average normalization against everything else, which is what the loudest words are. Um, so when I did this, I made essentially as far into the drop as I could. I did the side chaining, and then I did the drum sort of leveling and whatever, and then I mastered all that as if it were done. And then I built the rest of the track around it, and the purpose of doing so is that, like I said, you can't, it's really hard to guess at what a pre-master mix is in a way that when you put it together, it'll act like that. Because if I didn't just have the mastering on, just... Nothing about that makes sense as a mix unless I knew what the compression was going to do to the mix, which is something that's really hard to kind of predict. I, I mean, you don't, I've done this enough times that I probably could predict it if I, if I was, you know, forced to, but it's a lot easier to make decisions about, like, you know, because the traditional method of doing this is that you do your mix and then you send it, send it to an engineer to get it mastered or you do it yourself, but you separate the processes. And as a result, when you go to do the mastering, it doesn't behave the way you thought it would. You have to go back to your mix to change things. So it's a lot easier just to do it all at once where you have your master on and you go, oh, and then, you, and then instead of trying to fix it on the master, which you could do, you could fix it on the mix, which is... I personally think a little, a little bit smarter. And the reason why I think it's a little bit smarter is because there's a lot you could do with compression, there's a lot you could do with mastering to fix a mix, but you will never have the most perfect blending of mix and mastering if you're not fixing it in the mix, like with the mix on the mix side. Because the reason for that is that you have your compression, you can fix it to be compression, or you have your mix and you can make your mix perfectly fit what the compression is supposed to do. So now at this point, it barely even matters what your compression is doing, which is honestly why my masters is less, is honestly less complicated. Like I have an EQ here. It's not <laughs> it's doing a thing. It's imperceptible almost. And honestly, if I weren't lazy, I could have, I could have accomplished this, but just in the individual part, in individual motions, you know, on different elements. But what's, what's in common in my master chains and pretty much all my tracks is how very little I'm doing. Um, and with the multiband side of things, and then I just limit it pretty hard on the master. And, a lot of the best tracks in history were pretty much done this way with the idea that the biggest focus was not on what the literal master effects are doing, but what everything is doing before the master effects, which sounds an awful lot like I'm saying the mix is way more important than the master, but I'm still saying that they're both important together. They're both the same thing. And if you treat them as being the same thing, then you'll end up creating a, a symbiosis of your pre-master and your master that you could not have possibly accomplished if you treat, treated them as individual ideas. I thought I'm saying that this track is, you know, the most perfect thing ever, but it, I wouldn't have been able to get it this good if I was doing it individually. Also, I want to point out that um, there's really no, uh, there's not really a reason to separate like the projects. Like they have like, here's my mix project, render it out as a thing, and then render and then master that in its own project. There's not a reason to do that. Um, there are some techniques that revolve around utilizing 32-bit ray files and then turning them up or whatever, but you can actually literally just do that in the project. If you have some kind of like process concern, like you have a project that idles at 44% where you're not doing anything, then maybe there's a reason to do that to, you know, master outside of that because then you can have more control over what you're doing without underruns. But if you don't have that problem, like I don't because I have a ridiculous computer or, or you're making a project that doesn't necessitate a ridiculous computer, then you can just do it in the project and it's fine. It's totally fine. Ah, still those with the running. Ah. Um, anyway, what I'm specifically doing on the master though, uh, on the low end, we can see this configuration. This is perfect, basically. It's not even really about what levels are hitting and what's going on. It's just that you can see a very clear separation between the thing that is the bass and the thing that is the kick. And you want the kick to be a lot bigger than the thing that is the bass, but you want the both to be consistent. And this is super easy to do when you separate your subs, because this means that in the low end, in this little area of the frequency spectrum, because of the cut that I'm doing on the uh, the EQ that's in the side chain and the sub that's all by itself, even without using compression at all, there are only two things even down there, the bass of the kick and the sub, which means that like the dynamic range in there is controlled entirely by the individual level of the kick and the sub. I don't even need to do any any kind of like graphic graphic change or whatever. I can just I just turn it up and that's the end of that. 
or if I wanted to, I could turn the sub up or turn the kick up. There's that I don't have to compress anything with a compressor. I could just compress it by changing the levels, which would control dynamic range that way. It's still compression. I'm just not using a compressor. It's a lot more deliberate. It's a lot more under my control. The mids, are, the mids and the highs are a bit of a different story. So they're not even really that busy, but every once in a while there's just gigantic peaks that show up that aren't even related to something like a snare. Like there is the snare hit and that's fine. That comes out every time, but then there's just things that come up here. And like these kinds of outliers are why compressors exist. Because if I were to just EQ out that frequency that showed up that one time, it would bring down this frequency, this frequency spectrum over here where it was okay. And it brings it down evenly across everything else. The compressor only brings it down when it doesn't matter. And like, I could probably have set up an EQ to kind of react to the level in such a way, but this is um, a much more specific uh, sort of general generalized result. And if you do it fast enough, it doesn't sound like anything's happening. So that, 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 that comes into where these sort of time variables are. But you can see I'm using a lot of attack. On the low, mid, and high bands, the attack means different things than it does in the master. The attack does what you actually expect a regular compressor attack to do in the low mid high, which is to say that it, it, it sort of uh, holds off on engaging for a second. It's, in this case, uh, seven milliseconds. Wow, if I zoom in far enough, you might be able to see it happen. Kinda, okay, so you can see how this isn't a straight line. So the peak, got, the peak hit and it kind of engaged up like this. This is the attack, because if I had low attack, it would just it'd be a straighter line and it would have done anything. The, the purpose of this, the usually why you want to have this kind of thing is because you want to preserve transients. Because a compressor, if it's, if it's just limiting, perfect ratio, not doing anything, it'll just cut it off and then it'll be, you know, like this, where it's just like, blah, blah, blah. But even here, you can kind of see that the transients are being, a little bit, uh, are being preserved. So instead of it just being a flat, perfectly even, uh, balanced hit, we can see that there is actually still like the, the relationship of there's a there's a, a big attack hit and then a kind of tail of what the actual percussion is doing. This for like the reason that like doing this up here actually sort of prevents me from having to do this in a, a drum bus. And the reason why I don't have a drums bus is because of what you heard what the mix was doing. The kick of the snare was just massively louder than everything else, and the hats were too high frequency to actually care about what they're interacting with. Um Higher frequency sounds don't require as much power as lower frequency sounds to, to actually sound as loud as each, as each other just over the air. Like a sub a sub hit has like just a sub frequency needs to be like super power for you to be able to hear it comparison in comparison to like a, a solid tone, like a 10k hertz tone. Doesn't need that. Hats and stuff are predominantly up there. So this means that like we don't need them to be that loud levels wise for us to hear them to compete with everything else, which else which makes them really, really easy to mix. Um and, that, and as a result, I don't really need to do a lot with uh, with these guys. I think I have, yeah, I have a limiter here, which is um, doing side chanting, literal side chanting. Because I have reverb on the thing, and it's pumping the reverb, just doing that kind of deal. It was low low, uh, <laughs> import, low priority enough that I just did that with a limiter, not like with manual manual uh, ducking. Uh, yeah, anyway, but the... Other, the rest of the time variables, a compressor has these basic time time variables, and the the one the two that matter are attack and release. The other the other ones, the ahead and then the the look ahead delay, which is this guy over here, they do different things. And I don't really use them a lot, and so it's not you know super important. But the um, making the point about time variables, yeah. So a compressor is like whenever you. Actually, the typical response when, when somebody listens to a song and they think to themselves, hmm, that's overcompressed, that, that's really not actually what they mean. Because they will hear versions of songs that are just as loud, way more compressed, but they'll, they'll like it better. And the reason why they like it better is because it won't have that kind of muddy aftertaste to it. And that muddy, muddy weirdness to it is the product of not having fast enough time variables. And so if you have too slow a time variable, it'll it'll be mud up. But if you have too fast a time variable, something else happens, which is distortion. If compression reacts faster than an individual oscillation of an actual note, it will change the shape of the waveform, which is distortion, also known as wave shaping. Uh, fun fact, if you get if you turn off all the time variables inside Maximus, it will act just like the wave shaper, which is really cool. On the front, though, attack does, does something completely different. An attack, The attack on the master channel is actually just look-ahead delay. The reason why that's not true on the limit high is because it requires one whole parameter to be the delay for all three of them at once. Because the look-ahead delay actually delays the output audio. So the input will hit, and the, and the audio will come out later, but the compression will like ramp up a bit to it because it's leading up to the hit. It actually engages before the hit so that it's actually engaged when the hit happens. There's reasons to do that. It's actually some, some, some of them are pretty cool. None of them are used in this track. 
Um, and the reason why it's not fully off over here is because if the, if the attack, if that particular nature of that attack is all the way off, it can get kind of crispy. It just so happens that I like it to be kind of crispy, which is also why I'm using the soft saturation over here. The soft saturation is initially designed to actually act like saturation, uh, like, a, like, a, like tape distortion, which is what happens when you clip it. It doesn't actually clip on tape. What it does is that when you push it up, up high, it rounds off a bit. It still creates, it's still distorting it. It will still create additional harmonic content, but it rounds off. Um, if it would do that here, if I set the threshold to actually do that, this is essentially the range of saying it rounds off before it hits up, but it comes back down again. That's not what I'm doing though. I'm keeping the threshold as small as possible and the ceiling at zero dB and it's just clipping pretty hard. However, it's not literally clipping. This is algorithmic clipping. The difference is, is that algorithmic clipping will be done on purpose and will sound the same on most systems. Actual clipping will create uh, information that's essentially physically possible for a speaker to, you know, produce, but it'll still try. And this means that different speakers will behave quite differently to that kind of information than it would if it were algorithmic distortion, which takes into consideration, you know, actual properties of sampling. Like, I'm not 100% clear on like what little clipping does, but there is a difference and there's a reason why doing it on purpose is better than just actually letting it clip. I've tried that before. I had mastered tracks just by letting it clip and it worked out pretty okay, but there's still some just slight problems with it that were not necessarily the greatest idea. Some of you might remember how I talked about how Noisia used to clip their things, and I say it used to because they kind of saw the light on that. And in fact, a little tidbit about it sounding different on all systems was something that I got from them. Um, now, the reason why this works is because I have a, I do have compression here, but you see here, it's not a perfect limit. This would be a perfect limit. Well, if I had snap on, that would be a perfect limit. This would be a ratio of two to one, one to two, two to one. And that's essentially saying for every two dB in, only one dB comes out. And this is like this over here is like uh, three to one maybe, and uh, so this means it's still compressing kind of hard, but it's not limiting. This, which means, is that it's actually letting information go above zero dB if it gets pulled up above here, but not by a lot. This is good because while I do want it to clip, I want it to stay at zero dB. I don't want to compress too hard, too fast, because that's there is the actual danger to over compression. But I'm taking care of it with um, using the soft saturation, which is still compressing things. Distortion and compression are the same process, which would include you when I told you about how, what you know, the internal time variables and this acts like the wave shaper. The wave shaper acts like the maximus too, only the, it, its difference is that it doesn't have time variables. It, it cuts and happens immediately. And that immediacy comes at a, uh, a price of just distorting things. The reason why this works, the whole build up to that whole, that whole idea that this works is because all that distortion does to a sound is that it adds higher frequency information. It adds high harmonics. Like when you uh, saturate a sine wave, you create a square wave. A square wave is just the ultimate, you know, saturation of a sine wave. If you, um, yeah. So if the, per, if the, per, if most of the information you have in your song, most of the sounds or whatever are already distorted or already very high frequency, like, information, then you really aren't going to notice a little extra bit of it. And you can notice it, like if I push it too hard, too far, too fast, but essentially too far past the threshold, we it gets to be a problem. But we're not pushing it that far because uh, while it's keeping it at zero dB, the compressor is also helping to keep peaks down lightly. And, and it's not, we're essentially getting the best of both worlds by not having it go too far past the ceiling of, of, of distortion and using gentle compression to kind of bring it down the rest of the way. Combining these two things, we're able to get pretty loud without uh, sacrificing sort of the dynamics of the track, which you might be thinking, what dynamics? And you'd be right, because if you're designing a track not to have dynamics, don't be surprised that it doesn't have dynamics. Although it does actually have dynamics. It has spectral dynamics, because while the end result of all of this might just be a giant sausage, <laughs> This is a very, uh, I'm going to say juvenile, I guess elementary way of looking at an entire song because if you look at the rest of the things, you can see, oh, look, there's dynamic range in the bass. There's dynamic range in the mids. There's a lot of dynamic range in the highs. So these, your songs are still very dynamic. They just happen to sum up together with full spectrum to be with sausage. So, I mean, and back in the day, I used to essentially ruin dynamics by getting rid of all, of, making the bass exactly as loud as the kick, making everything else exactly as loud as the snare, that kind of thing. That's what I would used to go for, and it showed, and it didn't necessarily sound very good. But even, you can still have plenty of dynamics, and you can still be loud as shit. So that's easy enough. It's, it honestly is pretty easy. It's like, the only the only hard part is just kind of removing yourself from ideas that you've held on to for so long because people that you thought you knew what they were talking about said stuff, and you kind of just took it to heart. Um, I guess I'm no different, so let's hope I'm right. 
uh, yeah. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. I'd like to point out that you can actually buy this project at the uh, fixed store. Go get the deluxe version. You can get individual products. You don't have to buy all of them at once, but you, if you do, you get a discount. Um, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.